So, something different today for the channel is I have the construction and technology manager from Boston Dynamics with me to talk everything robotics. Uh, Brian Ringley, hello and thank you for being here. Hi Carl, thank you so much for the invite. Oh, you're more than welcome, thank you for accepting. Um, sort of to jump off though, I think, I think it's worth noting that we spoke about five or six years ago about everything grasshopper and parametric design, mm -hmm. and you were still uh, the computational design specialist at Woods Bagot, which That's right. yep. it's worth noting that is an Australian founded architecture firm, but it obviously is a pretty major international one these days. And yeah, like a hun over, well over 100 years old too, which not many people know. Over 150, I think, maybe. Oh, yeah, I'm lowballing it. Yeah, um, I, could, I could be very wrong. Um, <laughs> but now you're with Boston Dynamics, probably the most famous robotics company in the world. And I was wondering if you could share sort of the, the journey that you had to end up there from architecture. Oh, goodness. Yeah, I mean, um, the, do you want the like short version or the long version? How long have I got you for? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm constrain it. You know, it's interesting. I, I should write a blog post on this because just to contextualize this is I get a lot of people reaching out on LinkedIn and, you know, through like past teaching engagements and things like that, where it's students or people early in their career. And they're saying, hey, I have an architecture education, too, but I also want to end up in robotics. You know, can you kind of guide me in, in how to best angle for that and i always have a kind of a hard time answering that question because I, I didn't plan to be here uh it was i think a lot more natural than than maybe it seems uh when you kind of like post rationalize the career trajectory but i started i started with a strong interest in technology ever since i was a kid um you know like the idea of drafting technologies 3d modeling technologies 3d printing was emerging at the time, I mean, those were all things that I thought were really compelling, and I saw them as part and parcel of architecture, which was also a love and an interest of mine, the idea of designing buildings and spaces. I always wanted to be a very traditional architect. I just figured, yeah, you use technology as an architect, I want to be a designer, but I graduated in the recession, and that really ended up being, I think, the main impact on my career which was I started going quite a bit deeper into things like um, CNC programming and manufacturing, for example, than I would have otherwise, where I had kind of a baseline familiarity with it to, you know, I took that on as my first job after school because I couldn't get hired at a design practice. So then you're getting that 40 hours a week of expertise of actually engaging in that. Um, that then kind of led in parallel to teaching because that's what you do when you're broke and <laughs> you're not quite making it from your from your day job. You also try to teach. Plus, like, you know, bringing those, I thought it would be interesting to bring those ideas into curriculums where digital technology was still pretty young or hadn't been introduced into architecture curriculum yet. Um, apologies if that siren is deafening. We'll just give that a second. That's fun. There's, there's that Brooklyn authenticity. Yep. You wanted um, <laughs> <laughs> so um and and then i was able my my big kind of break in terms of being able to move to new york because i was from ohio and was living in cincinnati and had gone to school there and worked there was uh getting hired into the cuny system at city tech and i was excited because it was a huge nsf grant and it, it was about establishing a digital prototyping lab or digital fabrication lab but it was also about establishing curriculum and it was an unaccredited program. Sorry, what, so what, yeah. what year would this have been, Brian? Oh, right. So uh, working as a CNC machinist was like as a grad student, 2008, 2009, and then a few years after through the end of 2011. And then January of 2012, yep. I moved to Brooklyn and started uh, what we called the Fuse Lab at City Tech. Mm hmm and this was in their architectural technology program so it was nice that it was unaccredited because we got to do whatever we wanted and kind of experiment with the curriculum in a way that kind of mimics contemporary practice for example there'd be like a seminar on BIM, a seminar on fabrication and a seminar on 
you know, analysis uh, for like building performance and sustainability. And then we'd string those together as if they were stakeholders working together on the same project and even sharing models through the cloud with the technologies that were kind of available at the time. Um, and we had a lot of industry uh, partners in there. And one of them was Shane Berger from Woods Bagot. And so at this time, uh, Samri and Adelaide, I think had, had been pretty recently finished. I don't remember, maybe like 2010 or 2011, that project was, I think, wrapped. And, you know, I was just hugely inspired by that facade. Um, and it was an early example of the facade that was driven by uh, solar analysis studies, design computation, contemporary fabrication techniques. I mean, they did a lot of really cool things with that project. And then there was an opening on Shane's team. Uh, so this would have been, I think, 2014. And that was like my dream job, right? I like wanted to be finally get back into practice, but be practicing with these tools that I had grown to know and love. And I think it was good to be a CUNY because it kind of took what I knew because I really started in the fabrication and the making space. That's what appealed to me most. But then I was able to learn BIM and um, kind of building performance and energy analysis tools while I was teaching those, you know, teaching is the best way to learn um, and able to kind of combine all of those things in the context of practice and actually delivering buildings at Woods Bagot. So then I was at Woods Bagot from 2014 to 2017 on the design technology team. Um, it was an amazing experience. That's an incredible firm and got to go to Australia many times, which is super cool. Uh, and in fact, my Qantas points are going to expire this summer if I don't book something soon. So maybe it's time to come back to Australia. Oh, good luck getting in. <laughs> yeah, right. If they let me in. Um, so, uh, and, and went to Perth twice, a place I never thought I'd go once and ended up going twice. So that was fun. Um, but worked on a lot of really interesting projects um, and actually finished uh, the last project I worked on was uh, a building called the 11th by uh, Bjark Ingels group. So Woods Bagot did the scope for the exterior wall. So I had focused on a lot of stuff. Andrew Human was there with me and we had developed some tools called Wombat for, for Grasshopper and Dynamo and Revit. And those are now I think largely open source and available and continued on and improved by that amazing team. Um, and uh, so we spent a lot of time, you know, building internal tools for our teams to automate design processes, um, a fair amount of analysis type things, but by and large, it was the rationalization of complex tower geometry into a form that can be documented and, and sent out for shop drawings or fabrication or construction document sets. So a lot of time in Grasshopper? I mean, so again, back to like building that expertise. I mean, that was probably the only time in my life where it was like 40 hours a week, like again, like just uh, immersed in one way of working and one way of, you know, so yeah, just all grasshopper. I mean, with a, a dash of some Python scripting, uh, C -sharp .net development for zero touch Dynamo nodes and grasshopper library development. Um, I didn't get too much into the pure Revit stuff. Andrew was much more skilled at uh, understanding the Revit API than I was. Um, and we were also, you know, prototyping. We really believed in, you know, visual programming as a way to do mature software development. So we were using like Human UI, a program again by Andrew that, you know, that took like WPF and, and Windows UI elements and allowed you to control them in the same graph that controls the rest of the logic, such that we could present user interfaces rather than you know, the code underneath. Because yeah, Grasshopper is accessible and kind of democratizes the ability to do design computation for a subset of professional practitioners, but it's not, it's still not something that is gonna kind of jive with the way that everyone works, but most people understand a standard interface. Yes. So, so that really, you know, we really prided ourselves on kind of having an interface first approach. We were by no means like UX designers or anything like that. You know, a lot of respect for people who specialize in that, but we recognize the importance of, of not just the performance and the functionality of the tool, but, but the way that the user interacts with that. You know, Andrew now is at Hypar and 
I mean, a lot of lessons, a lot of things that we were promoting there, you know, and also led by by Shane Berger kind of as the as the visionary on the team was this kind of importance of the UI, but also this importance of you're never going to encapsulate everything in an automated routine. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a way to kind of jump between different levels of abstraction and ways of working. The common example being like direct manipulation of geometry versus like par parameter manipulation, you know, like sliders versus actually deforming or, you know, modeling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with geometry. Um, Again, an idea he's continued on into high part, but we built some really, you know, unholy uh, grasshopper rhino interactions that would that would allow people to do that. So I ended that project on the Bjarkingel's um, 11th tower, which was, you know, an exterior wall project that we were doing construction documentation on, and it was a geometrically complex building. And you know, at that point in time, WeWork was really hot, and I had a lot of you know, really talented friends working there. And, you know, if I were working in architecture, you know, I could easily spend a career at Woodsbeck. And I mean, there's so much opportunity there. They're doing a lot of amazing things. But what I, what I realized for myself and my career trajectory was that there was just limited impact that you could have because of the way that design bid build works, because of the traditional kind of delivery models and business practices of any architecture firm right not to single out you know one or the other it's kind of a big industry problem and the idea of getting to go to we work where it was vertically integrated where you could work on construction sites in factories working on design automation tools working with a sales team working with designers and kind of figure out how to make all that stuff work together that was really compelling so also while i was at woods bag i had transitioned from cuny to pratt and had helped Pratt set up their, uh, I had set up the first industrial robotic arm at CUNY, like a little baby IRB, ABB IRB 140, a little metal grub. Um, <laughs> it's so heavy, but so small, so much steel. Um, and then we, uh, and then we set up uh, a couple robot arms. Uh, so this was led by Mark Parsons, the Pratt School of Architecture. I was brought on to just specifically uh, to write some curriculum for the robots in the graduate school, uh, graduate architecture and urban design program. Um, and, you know, did, did a fair amount of stuff there, like looking at material systems and things like that. So I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but there was this kind of professional practice trajectory, which was design computation for a little bit of analysis, but mostly geometric rationalization. And then there was this other vector where I was working directly with robots and thinking about, you know, custom tooling, manufacturing processes, and computation for fabrication processes. Um, not super different. In one, we just had the ability to actually make something, physically make something at the end. So it's more tangible as a pedagogical exercise. Whereas in practice, it was like, well, at some point, you know, the head's going to get disconnected from the model, and then we don't have scope for manufacturing. So what was nice about WeWork was like, let's bring these things together. Um, so let's work on design automation tools for something really common in our kit of parts, like the storefront system, the interior aluminum and glass partitions. Let's do like design automation stuff. And again, Andrew Human's there driving the design automation side of things, doing some really innovative stuff there, you know, helping us think about spatial modules as they relate to both the, you know, the sale of the space with desk count and the function of the space in terms of like a skew mix and the floor plan relative to an existing condition and then downstream to manufacturing. So I was on the construction automation team. We were focusing largely on the factory side. So how do I get design orders into an ERP system? Um, how do I get instructions um, or setup sheets into machine operators' hands? We had a lot of customized aluminum CNC machines that could kind of make parts to order. And, you know, it was interesting because I, a lot of experiments in academia, you know, you go file to factory kind of conceptually as a mock-up, which is like, I've got a grasshopper script and I can communicate even in real time with an industrial robot in front of me. It's very tangible, but in a, in a business sense, you could do that, right? Like you could reverse, reverse engineer like any kind of text-based machine code and kind of output that from directly from a design model, but it's like, that's too seamless in a business. Like you, you actually need to go through some QA, QC, you need to go through an ERP system and build an order and track that. 
you need to communicate with machine operators as an intermediary to make sure they're uploading the right data into the machine in the first place. Um, and that was really eye-opening. I mean, it seems obvious in retrospect, but you know, just kind of went in there gung-ho, like you can do anything with Grasshopper and code and CNC and blah, blah, blah. So, um, so that, was, that was a good lesson. And then on top of that, once you produce it, how do you automate the installation? How do you automate like the layout process and the construction monitoring process? So the other half of what I was doing there in addition to factories was field robotics. And this is really what drew me to WeWork was like, ooh, robots other than industrial arms, cool. Well, let's so, let's not get carried yeah. away. <laughs> we'll, we'll, well, I guess we're always gonna end up talking about Spot, but big fan yeah. of the industrial arms, but sure. Oh no, and so, and the point I wanna make here too is that like, it was never that, you know, mobile field robots versus industrial arms for industrialized construction and offsite prefabrication. It was, how do I use both? They are both really important to the automation and industrialization of the job site. So it was very much kind of with that in mind. But that said, I we had a lot of talented people on the factory side. It allowed me to be freed up to start to think more specifically about the field side. And that's where that's where I ran into many challenges. So, you know, drones. Uh, we had some drones at back at CUNY, you know, I, the old Parrot styrofoam ones. I don't know if you remember those. Oh, those absolutely. Were, yep. Those were kind of like the first like affordable ones that everybody started flying around. Uh, and, you know, there are ways to operate drones indoors, but, and they're so great for the outdoor data capture stuff, like such an incredible technology and arguably like, you know, the first field robot that's really been, you know, adopted and mass in construction, but they're just operational and safety limitations and payload limitations indoors. So we then evaluated wheeled and tracked vehicles and they would just get stuck on everything. They, you know, they weren't able to access all the areas of the site we needed them to. So I had done some initial kind of sniffing around with legged robot uh, locomotion. It, when I first joined, we were in like 2017, and my report was like, you know, here's what Agility Robotics is working on, and here's what Boston Dynamics is working on, and this is a locomotion paradigm that could be useful in the future, but it seems really exotic, and I kind of dropped it because I was like, there's just no way, right, that we're going to bring legged robots. Boston, uh, 2017, Dynamics would have been big dog already? Um, I think, no, Spot was, Spot was a thing. Um, All right. Yep. Yeah. Spot, Spot, I think started around 2015. Mm -hmm. So first there was Spot Classic and then like Spot Mini where they first added the arm and then they started getting into the Spot Alpha around, uh, probably around this time where they were all black. They yep. weren't safety yellow yet because they hadn't been really brought onto a lot of industrial sites. And so I kind of dismissed it. It was like, I want to acknowledge the fact that this is a locomotion paradigm, you know, hexapods, quadrupeds, and bipedal humanoid robots, but that's probably not what we're going to see on a job site. But then I was like, oh my God, I can't get any of these wheeled or tracked or flying robots to get, to do useful autonomous data mm. capture on my job site. So the point too, like the business problem we were trying to solve was that we had acquired a few general contractors. They didn't really have robust data capture processes. We're supposed to be a data-driven company. Yep. We wanted automatic, you know, work in place quantification so that we could make sure the projects were being managed on time and on budget. And we were building a ludicrous amount of square footage year over year. Mm -hmm. And you know, any little bit helped. So um, and then there was a YouTube video in 2018 by Boston Dynamics of an alpha spot unit walking around a Japanese construction site. And like, I freaked out and I went, I like started running around and I went to like Dave Fano and I went to Tim Dumitre and some of these other like former case people who were, you know, in leadership positions in the WeWork kind of construction and design orgs. And I was like, we got to find a way to talk with these people. And then it turned out that they were surprisingly accessible. Uh, we took the train up to Boston we signed on and kind of committed to be an early um, kind of proof of concept customer. I mean, really, even before there was like a formalized early adopter program um, and then got the robot on our job site starting in December 2018. Yeah. And throughout uh, 
spring and summer of 2019, we're really able to prove, yes, this thing can get around the site. Yes, it can do it autonomously and repeatably. Um, and we're actually able to use the Python clients and the SDK to send this data over job site Wi-Fi um, to with some, you know, funny business around how Wi-Fi works on job sites, which I suppose we should get into, but it's hard yep. um, and it's bad. Uh, but we got it into FieldLens, which was the construction management software that, that we work had acquired. And that to me kind of sealed the deal, which is like, okay, if I can have this thing, now we're talking like, you know, minimal to zero labor hours. We're upping the quality and the amount of our data capture. And I don't have to move the data from the robot to the cloud where the stakeholders need it. Like it'll just go there and then the project, man project managers can just see the progress remotely. Like that's, that's the dream. Um, and it kind of struck me at that point that this might be where I can have the most impact on construction, you know, with my career trajectory and my interests and skill sets, you know, this is where I could kind of be most in service to the industry. Uh, so after being their customer for a while, I had kind of, I was like, what if I, what if I worked for you, you know, had that conversation. Um, and, you know, then in uh, December, 2019, joined Boston Dynamics. So that's how you get into the robotics industry from architecture. In, you know, 20 easy steps. It's, it's, um, I get asked the question on a common uh, regular basis, the sort of how to become a roboticist. And I think I'll just uh, give them your email. Talk to Brian. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so now that you're with Boston Dynamics and you've been there a couple of years, what's the biggest shift in your sort of day to day shifting from a traditional architecture firm as traditional as Woods Bagot can be, obviously it's a large scale firm, through the WeWork time and then into Boston Dynamics. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because if you look at, if you look at like, what was my day to day at Woods Bagot was like, I would sit down and I would just, you know, design mm -hmm. all day. And it was, maybe it was in grass, you know, most of the time it was project work like doing some kind of grasshopper, you know, resolving problems or modeling issues, um, workflow issues on a, on an ongoing project, uh, with a kind of smattering, which was like, if there were breaks between projects to kind of consolidate, like the learnings from that and develop training curriculum or start to develop tool sets to mm -hmm. automate ourselves. Right. <laughs> Just to say, okay, everybody keeps trying to make rectangles out of twisty towers. There's probably a way to make a button for that and then kind of distributing that in training. The firm so it was very much like you know from nine to five i knew exactly what i was doing i was just kind of heads down and deep focused work then and then i was like a psycho and then i'd go off in the evenings and like teach you know three classes or whatever but uh because that's the new york hustle um and then when i went to we work it became um i mean without going into the ways in which <laughs> we work was managed and you know kind of how scatterbrained things could be sometimes at that scale when you're growing that quickly, mm. the work became um, much more about research. And I'm not, you know, I never got a PhD. You know, I have a, I have a graduate degree, I have an MARC, but, uh, you know, research is still something of a, you know, something that I don't feel like I'm formally trained in. So, you know, we had, there was a great team there led by Daniel Davis doing a lot of kind of user-based research um and they had you know data scientists and sociologists and just an incredible like team and you know i learned a lot from them in terms of like how to do good research and how to frame research and then specifically you know working with other people to figure out how to frame that in the context of what was often how do i how do i estimate roi for construction robots mm -hmm. So there was time, you know, creating pilot plans, research plans, trying to estimate ROI costs, understanding costs, right? So doing a lot of internal research, how do we procure materials? How is labor charged? You know, it's like simple things, which is like, all right, I'm going to, you know, test this drywall finishing robot to figure out how much, you know, savings there are. So let's see how much we spend on drywall finishing labor. And then you go to the project manager in that region and they're like, oh, well, that's just a unit cost where like labor is inclusive. And then they're like, oh, OK, so we don't know how much of that is labor. And it's like, well, there are some industry surveys and standards that 
suggest that this is a very labor intensive trade. So maybe it's 80%. So you end up, you know, saying, okay, 80% of the unit cost is labor. And then, you know, now what are the robots capabilities? Like which types of walls can it finish relative to the types of projects we do? So maybe yep. it's like 80% of that unit cost, but then it can only do 50% of building surfaces. So it was a lot of like that type of math. Um, but it was also a ton of like, like admin and legal work, right? It was like setting up NDAs because uh, we were working with companies that are now all out of stealth, right? So it's like, you know, so you've got like Dusty Robotics yep. doing light out, you've got Canvas doing drywall finishing, you've got Hilti's J Bot doing 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 drilling, spot the spot robot before it was commercially available and in several others. Uh, but at the time everything was super stealth. Like there were a lot of like NDAs and then there was also a lot of agreements about data privacy and thinking about it was just like so much time with lawyers, but I learned a lot there too, actually about, you know, IP law and real estate law and, and like robotics ethics and, and stuff that has actually served me well. Um, and, but it was insane how much of my time was spent doing that. So my time became very scattered and fragmented. Mm. It was not focused work. Like occasionally I could focus on kind of doing like ROI calcs or summarizing a report of how a, uh, how a site specific pilot had gone. Um, or even to develop like, uh, you know, grasshopper became something that I went from using 40 hours a week to something that like just became a quick prototyping tool, which actually speaks to the benefit of knowing something like that, which is, I was like, Oh, I need a, I need something that can quickly visualize like what coverage we're getting of our drywall by this robot. So it could be like, okay, you know, whip up like a quick interface where you input the robot parameters that we knew. And then maybe you have a scale relative to, you know, that robot manufacturer's roadmap, right? So we can project future value. Mm -hmm. um, and then like some interop stuff to just pull the relevant families from, and we had all sorts of sweet BIM tools and access to data too, right? So I could just like dial up whatever project and whatever like family type or element type. Um, so, you know, it really served me well as like a quick prototyping tool, but became something I used like 1% of the time instead of 100% of the time. Yep. Now in my role at Boston Dynamics, um, I'm a product manager. Mm. So again, another thing that I wasn't formally trained in. So I'm using components of what I knew as a designer, um, as a, as a, I'm like so reluctant to call myself like a coder now that I'm around like the world's, you know, best engineers, but you know, as somebody who, who fiddled with <laughs> design computation, um, and, and the learnings from kind of the research the, you know, the research and kind of framing things in terms of like everything was about value proposition. You know, a lot of what we called, uh, well, I don't want this to be too pejorative, but like a lot of times in academia, like the research is like, can I expand the design space, <laughs> right? It's like, how do, I, how do I achieve freedom of form with a particular material? And I think that's totally appropriate at that level, but, but research at this level was like, how do I save money? Yep. Like that's all that matters. And that's really serving me well in the role of a, of a product manager is to kind of identify, you know, who's buying this? What's the pathway to market? Um, what do we really need to be focusing on to, to add value to what are primarily general contractor customers for routine data capture and project management? And then how do I work with our engineering team to mm -hmm. facilitate that feature development? And it is so fun to work with engineers that are this talented where like they, they can do anything. Right. It's like not a matter of like, if they can do it, it's a matter of prioritization. And that's really where I come in, yep. which is to, to make sure that the trajectory uh, is, is, is hitting in the right way uh, for the construction worker. Super interesting. We've, I've, I've sort of danced around it because I didn't want it to be the immediate sort of point of topic for this conversation. I really want it to be focused on sort of the architectural side as well as the journey into robotics from an, someone similar to me who started as traditional architecture at school. But can you sum up spot for me in a sentence for maybe yeah. those who haven't been lucky enough to play with one or seen one? Yeah, Spot is a four-legged robot, often referred to as a robot dog by our customers, which I don't mind at all. Um, and it is an agile mobile robot solution. It can take a sensor of your choice anywhere, 
in your dynamic environment and then upload it to an integrated application of your choosing. So we really see it as, as an agile mobile robot solution mm -hmm. and, and primarily kind of a, you know, we now have the arm and we're moving into all of these manipulation use cases. And we also recently announced the uh, stretch robot in the warehouse space. So there's a lot of manipulation work, you know, robots actually doing things and interacting with the physical world, but by and large, the problems that we're solving in construction are all about sensing. Yep. That's a perfect lead into my next question because the main feature I see that people are using spot within architecture and construction is in data collection, primarily yep. in different methods and technologies of scanning during construction administration. So when yep. the, the building site is up and running and you know, the guys are on site and manufacturing the model, which is a very particular sort of position of a building's life cycle very early after the design phase. Do you think that the role of spot or future autonomous robots could uh, even move towards influencing architectural design or areas outside of construction? Yeah, I mean, I suspect so, but perhaps not in kind of the obvious ways, right? The, you know, one question I get a lot is, is how do I design differently to accommodate spot? Mm -hmm. The the issue with that question is that Spot is designed for human purposed environments. Spot is a solution that just where we're saying, you know, you have environments uh, that are designed for robots, like warehouses and other logistics spaces, right? Where it's like the building is a machine that accommodates automation. But what about the rest of the world? Yeah. Um, and the rest of the world is a really tough robotics problem and construction sites, arguably the toughest. <laughs> Um, cause they change every day and there's stuff on the floor and there's dynamic obstacles and, you know, there's, there's a puddle that mixes with sawdust and becomes a weird slime and then freezes and, you know, it's, you know, you name it, it happens. It's crazy. So, you know, we think that the construction environment is an excellent example, kind of a lens through which you can evaluate advanced autonomy and autonomy that, that functions in the real world, which is where people value. And this is why robots haven't really come into construction sites um, at a scaled way, right? There's a long history, you know, as far back as, as the early 80s that I'm aware of where, you know, lots of contractors have been testing automation on site, but in terms of something that you could deploy at scale in interior commercial construction environments, you know, Spot is a real breakthrough and a real differentiated technology. Mm -hmm. So my, my kind of response to how it impacts design is the goal here is not only to drive kind of design intent and design QAQC deeper into the delivery process by connecting models to delivery methods, both in the field and in the factory, but to establish a feedback loop mm -hmm. with as-built conditions on a continuous basis. So for somebody managing the job site, like the general contractor, you're saying, I need to, I just need to know, I need to stage materials, I need to stage teams, I need to stay on schedule, I need to pay people on time. It's all about managing the site. And it's, that's worth, you know, a bajillion dollars. And that's really where the focus is. But, you know, for, for architects, you could say, especially once we hit CA, what if we always knew exactly what was happening on site without leaving our office? Um, what if we had this kind of advanced, like, telepresence um, where we could navigate around a job site using our human operator minds and kind of hone in on, on things that we need to understand. But also, what if that information was just present in the model in which we were working? Mm -hmm. And so I think that it could be a, a fundamental change to the way that, that designers work because you would always be working with current as-built information, which never, ever aligns with the design model, right? Like, And this is another question I get from designers is, can I path plan or drive spot with BIM or with my model? And it's like, well, yes, you can use our SDK and there are ways that you can do that. Certainly. Would I do it with a typical Revit model? Um, I probably wouldn't trust it. And we spent a lot of time at the other thing that I really got out of WeWork was working with like a world-class reality capture team, understanding what it takes to survey a site, to register a point cloud with the right tolerance and accuracy, um, to distribute that data to stakeholders, and then for stakeholders to be able to use that data to kind of, you know, make corrections mm. or understand what they needed. But the other thing I noticed was that there was a huge bottleneck, which is 
BIM wasn't really designed for continuous, the continuous provision of reality capture data. Anyone who's worked with the point cloud in Revit is just like, I've got this huge, unwieldy, hard to visualize thing that I'm basically just overlaying on top of the rendering of my BIM elements and just looking manually to see if there's a deviation or a mistake or things like that. And, you know, we don't want that to be the case with, with Spot where you're getting more data than you can process. And that kind of leads to all sorts of interesting tools like Avere is an example I'm always pointing to where you can actually associate uh, features of point clouds with known elements in a common BIM platform like Revit, Avisworks, things like that, or even mm -hmm. some kind of P4. Um, kind of 4D method. And then that's just updating that model and calling things out to you. Because at the end of the day, what you want is you want to sit down each morning and you want a dashboard that tells you where your attention should be and how you should prioritize. Here's a huge mistake with a structural column that's actually going to require the structural designers to redesign the upper floors. And, you know, it's horrible and expensive, but if you do it now, it'll be half as horrible and expensive. Yep. Or just, hey, 50% of the drywall is up, uh, pay that sub now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, maintain your books and stay on schedule on budget and just run a tighter ship. And ultimately, what this builds toward, too, is a continuously as-built model with historical data, right, where you can scrub through over time and understand not only the conditions of something kind of at a previous point in time to compare to another point in time, but also to be able to get data points that won't be visible or easily accessible later on, like the decking and the rebar within a reinforced concrete slab or you know the interior of any wall for the MEP systems. These things are really valuable for the owner as the owner looks to take this data set and transition it into some kind of digital twin or operational model. Mm -hmm. And you know that, I think, could be an opportunity for architects as a service. They have strong priors in data management um, and BIM, but the GC operates the site. The GC tends to be the one investing in technologies that capture that data. Um, but the thing about Spot is Spot is kind of doing, and if I could draw a kind of uh, awkward parallel maybe, uh, or clumsy parallel between what Grasshopper did for design computation, essentially like what Spot's doing for reality capture, which is it makes it so damn easy Yep. to routinely laser scan a space or I, I think about it like just like setting up a tripod and like leveling a scanner and then like hiding behind something so that your body doesn't get caught in the scan and then you're bored so you like play a game on your phone for like eight minutes um and then you don't realize the scanner finished so you actually wasted a few minutes and then you go and you do it all over again and it's like no just put just mount it on this machine mm -hmm. this machine will go around to the, the exact points you specify, automate that. And, and it will also send that data to a remote network location, right? So it's taking care of that problem that I had identified all the way back in the early research at WeWork, which yep. was, we've got to get this into field lens, or I've got to get this into BIM 360, or I've got to get this into hollow builder or Trimble analysis tools, right? There are all sorts of ways that, because the data itself doesn't matter it's got to be contextualized in some kind of like ui and software paradigm where the user can can run analysis to get the kind of insight and reporting that allows them to then take some action that in turn makes them money right mm -hmm. so um bearing all of that in mind that's also why you know we're now trying to frame this robot as if you frame it as a complete solution then it's the robot is sensing the space is handling the transfer of that data to the remote network location. And then we're partnering, right? Building an ecosystem with all these technologies that already existed for analyzing that data. But now all of a sudden you actually have the amount of da data to get more value out of those things, right? Change, change detection algorithms and machine learning with computer vision, those work better if you have more frequent data sets and you're not trying to understand the difference between you know, demo and all your partitions are up and drywall finished versus mm -hmm. like demo, like partial framing, full framing. So it's a symbiotic relationship where the more data you collect, you know, the more you can kind of drive those tools and get value out of those analysis tools. And the more those analysis tools become valuable, the more people want to go out and increase that data capture. Yep, absolutely.
I think I think this touches on the sort of the scale of sites where we're seeing spot being adopted already by construction companies and the yeah. like, and they're all of a very particular scale, which I would say is quite large, because obviously they're the rooms where the most data can be collected and there's a lot of savings to be had. Do you see yeah. potential at smaller scales within architecture and construction? Yeah, I don't I don't think there's, you know, within reason, I don't think there's any particular size where it wouldn't be valuable. Mm -hmm. to be doing these things um i think it's it's one of those like potentially false data correlations where you think like oh the larger site is more valuable but people with larger sites have more money and larger budgets to invest in new technologies and of course then can leverage that at a scale um, to increase that return so it kind of remains to be seen but one of the things that i'm excited about is we're seeing spark kind of operate at all phases right from you know, just walking around on dirt and gravel um, to walking through finished buildings. Uh, we're seeing like horizontal, large horizontal sites like breweries, like what Pomerleau was doing in Montreal um, when they became a customer. And then we're seeing uh, what Turner Construction is doing, taking it to various high rises in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think there's a limit, but I, I do think that the larger projects have bigger budget, more wiggle room, and also have bigger owners who are kind of innovating in the sense that they're asking for new things, right? They're the ones who are going to be asking for the operational model or the digital twin. They're the ones who are going to increasingly mandate not just due diligence reality capture for example like you know capture demo conditions and capture a final as built but continuous reality capture which is i need that historical data i want a point you know point in time understanding of progress mm -hmm. um throughout throughout the cycle so yeah it's hard to say what ultimately will drive it but yeah big sites big owners is definitely is definitely where we're starting that's not the cheapest of equipment that's for sure no, yeah, and I think that, I think that, you know, we went through a lot of interesting exercises in the pricing of the robot. You know, one of the things that I comment on sometimes is, like, this is an industrial robot, right? Mm -hmm. This is, and and it's, you know, completely like innovative and groundbreaking technology, decades in the making. This is not like a consumer electronic, and I think part of the you know, confusion is you have like a segment of people who have been kind of robotics enthusiasts, like, oh, I wanted to buy one of these for my house. Well, it's not, that's not like probably the best environment. This is a robot meant to be in, you know, fixed industrial environments, in dynamic construction environments, offshore oil and rig, mining, like yep. hard, dangerous work, uh, nuclear plants, right? Um, and in a lot of these industries, the robot pays for itself instantly because it prevents shutdown of like a large energy plant, which is, you know, million plus dollars per day type thing, or it prevents uh, the need to put a worker in a potentially hazardous situation, um, which is, you know, pretty invaluable and hard to calculate there. So in construction, it's a little bit of a different game because while there are certainly opportunities to take people out of hazardous environments, you know, primarily this is used for data collection and project management. So the cost has to be justified through the project savings and the ROI has to then be calculated relative to what am I getting valuable in terms of increased data capture and these new capabilities to use that downstream to actually make better decisions. And then also how am I reducing the labor hours required to do that? And then also secondarily to that, now I'm freeing up labor to do other more valuable things for the savings from that. So it's a little bit more of a nuanced, it's not just like I didn't have to shut down my nuclear plant for an inspection and I saved you know a ton of money and I can buy a bunch of spots with that. Um, it's a little bit of a, you know, there's a lot more pencil and paper at it, but you know, we're finding that with the early adopters, at least through you know, we started that, I think, in earnest in January 2020 and then, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with all the COVID interruptions and continuing on now into kind of a larger construction market with like something like 500 spots out in the world across all industries. You know, that, that value is there. People believe 
people believe in that and are kind of proving that out step by step. Yes, I can capture more better structured data. Yes, I'm able to dr dramatically reduce or eliminate the labor hours required to do so and reallocate that labor to higher value tasks. And you know, this year we're really kind of digging into that full solution, which is now what do you do with that downstream? How do you leverage that data to make better decisions? So mm. we've got the integrated Trimble solution where you just go to Trimble and you say, I want a laser scanning robot. Like that's it. And you get the spot, you get the scanner, you get the mount, you get the protection, you get the tablet controller, the software, all in kind of one neat little package, which is great because, you know, R and D people love to nerd out on like spot and the SDK and like doing custom like mechatronics for like payload engineering and stuff like that. But your average general contractor is just saying, I need a solution to a business problem. Oh, here's an off the shelf product. Perfect. Yep. You yep. Know? And then it just comes and, you know, I attach a few things and, and I can be doing valuable work mm. that same day while still, you know, developing our SDK to make it easier for, the people who do need to develop custom solutions, but also for other people, you know, anyone who has a sensor that's valuable in any of these markets, anyone who has software where they wanted to communicate directly with the robot, whether it's to control the robot or to process information, or even in some cases to build your own autonomy stack. Like we've built everything off of our own SDK and it's really, really modular. Like we've taken great pains to make it modular and, and extensible and, you know, we've got people who come in and, you know, they could just swap out entire components of that. Um, and that's great. So, like, we're just saying you'll always have that, like, base performance of agile mobility and dynamics. And, you know, this thing's going to be able to, you know, catch itself if it slips and go up and down stairs and things like that. But anything else on top of that hmm. can be fully customized. And if you if you don't care about that, and you're just trying to solve a problem and you want to buy something, well, you know, you can go to Trimble and buy that solution. Or you can work with one of our other, you know, integrations in this market. You know, we've got stuff with drone deploy where people are combining spot data with data collected from drones and doing 3D reconstructions with photogrammetry. We've got Hollow Builder for you know, customers who by and large, you know, aren't the GC isn't necessarily coordinating in 3D, so they're doing a lot of 360 photo documentation with something like a Rego Theta or an Insta360 yep. handheld camera. And they just want to contextualize that still image data or those kind of video stream data pieces to documentation, right? Because that's the other thing is like BIM doesn't always and often does not survive the end of the design scope. So a lot of these general contractors are working off of, you know, document sets, 2D information, but there's a lot of smarts around that 2D information. Now, Hollow Builder, Structure Insight, and Open Space all have AI tools mm -hmm. that can essentially process and semantically recognize building elements from, you know, 3D imagery data, and then essentially like update the plan with markups. And it's like kind of a funny use of technology to like be adding like that advanced level of, of AI and computer vision on top of PDFs. But that's where the value is today, right? So, um, you know, being valuable today to customers and how they operate with a mind on tomorrow where we're moving into more BIM, more 4D construction, digital twin and operational models, you know, really trying to, to have a nice balance there. So now, so now that Spot is in the hands of a lot more people than it was a year and a half ago, have you had any customers that have really applied it in a manner that surprised oh. either yourself or others at Boston Dynamics that maybe the team just didn't, it wasn't obvious until someone else sort of did it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff um, and unfortunately I probably can't talk about a number of those things, but if you think about like the kind of wide array of industries we're serving, like we have people in entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. Making the robot dance. We have like YouTube influencers, um, uh, <laughs> who, who make some videos that I probably shouldn't publicly endorse, but are funny and entertaining and actually just show the wide variety of what you can do with the SDK. So if you want to Google piss bot. Oh, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll so flash inclined. it up on the screen yeah. right now. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but like, I mean, if, if you can get past the kind of crudeness of, of the video, I mean, there's, there's some real like engineering brilliance at work there. And, um, 
and and you know it just shows like how accessible that SDK is, and that's like an application with again machine vision and you know a robot going around and interacting with physical things in the real world mm -hmm. um, in a way that would be very difficult to do with you know any other kind of robotic platform. So so yeah, in in construction, I mean the the surprises aren't like oh i didn't expect you to use the robot like for that completely different use case or anything like that because we're all zeroed in on where the value is and it's just like fairly obvious and kind of honed in and focused on that but at the same time we get these like pleasant surprises like i remember the first time i saw the robot walk over top of uh, pre pour decking and rebar mesh um was a video, like a cell phone video that our customers at Hensel Phelps showed us from the San Francisco airport project. And I had been telling customers that Spot could not do that. Mm -hmm. I was like, don't do that. Like I had specifically, and I was like, oh, it does that. We just didn't realize that those capabilities were already kind of baked into the underlying performance and that we didn't have to you know, refine that particularly for that type of terrain, which is great, right? That's what you want. So we get, happy surprises like that where the robot does remarkably well and again that's really a strong suit right it's like handling any terrain hmm. balancing hmm. um you know the fact that and then we took uh you know when we had the robot out with the x7 laser scanner which is a fairly large and heavy you know by comparison to like a rico theta or something payload and again, just walking over pre port decking more easily than I could. Like it was nothing. Walking up and down stairs, walking up and down temporary like plywood construction stairs that are a steeper pitch than like normal stairs to code. So those are the types of pleasant surprises, which is just like how mobile this thing is, just kind of by default. And just, you know, coming up against things that it's, you know, never really encountered in the lab, but, you know, because there's such a robust solution to that and the underlying technology being able to handle it. Over the last uh, 10, 15 years, we've seen a big uptick in schools of architecture sort of incorporating robot labs and parametric design that comes along with that. Do you think we're going to see, or maybe maybe there's cases that I'm not aware of, but do you think we're going to see the spot included in some architecture schools? When architecture schools, I think, stop overly fetishizing making something, mm -hmm. perhaps. And so what we're seeing right now, um, and I, I, I wrote a, an article in Architect Magazine kind of about this, which is, you know, and I was certainly guilty of this too, which is architecture curriculums kind of, there's this mythos of the master builder. And a lot of it, again, pedagogically, it's to, it's to take a larger workflow with multiple stakeholders and points of friction and to simplify it, to teach a lesson about, you know, how can I go directly from a design model to a machine? Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned before, like the way we did that at Pratt, you know, you could kind of close that loop or at CUNY, you could close that loop. And, you know, at WeWork setting up the factory, it's not quite so simple, um, nor do you necessarily want to take on the risk associated with certain elements of that scope, even if you could do it. So, um, so I think there's this focus where like when I talk to, you know, that subset of academics, they want to know like, well, what can I build with it? What can I fabricate with it? And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, I understand that. And there's no reason you can't experiment in that way with the robot and the new manipulation arm and things like that, you know, have at it. I'm sure there are things that will surprise me and be like very interesting for the industry. But I think it's a, there's a total preoccupation with like, I have to fabricate something even though means and methods are not part of architect's work. So, you know, if we step back, we can kind of say, again, what is the value to establishing a data feedback loop? Mm -hmm. How well do I understand reality capture, right? Like, you know, is that part of a, you know, architecture fabrication lab? In some cases there is metrology equipment. Um, and I actually think it's an important lesson even for fixed industrial arms, right? You know, some of the most advanced industrial automation work cells aren't just going to rely on the kinematics of an arm because even with that real world forces will still deflect as you well know especially working with certain types of materials and you might need to course correct you might need to use um lidar or, or vision you know some kind of metrology and build that into your uh, feedback loop mm -hmm. for the robot so like on a kind of broader scale that's really what i think spot has to offer which is I've got all these really interesting computational models, but they're not 
adequately augmented in real time or near real time with the as built conditions and that can't react to that. So I think there is a body of research in in architectural academia about that feedback loop. Uh, some of it's with industrial arms, some of it's with like VR and AR, and I think that's what SPA has to offer. But yeah, I suppose the long story short, you know, I would love for a future of, you know, architecture schools doing all sorts of things with spot. But I think that there are, you have to kind of change the way you think about robotics to be a little bit more open to robotics as something that changed the way we process data and workflows and not, not only through the lens of fabrication and making. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we see construction management programs. You know, there are several that are doing really interesting research with spot publishing academic papers on things like position re repeatability for data capture. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, designers are like, well, I want to, I want to make something right. I want to make something that looks really sexy. Like, how do I do that with the robot? It's like, you could put a hot wire cutter on the end of it. No one's stopping you. I mean, uh, but you know, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Yeah. It's just another tool in the tool yeah. shed. I think I think one of the most uh, I wouldn't go as far as saying depressing, but there's been such a slow adoption of robotics in architecture compared to other industries, and I'm very well of, uh, well aware of a lot of architecture firms that invest in a robot and then it just sits there and collects dust, and a client, a big client will come through and they'll show the robot do a bit of movement and then it's turned off until yeah, the next the default, client. The default dance program exactly and just kind of snakes around exactly do you in in your opinion what do you think it's going to take to sort of change that at the architecture level yeah well what? i think yeah i think that there are different levels of kind of like making that that architects are usually involved in right there's like model shops and then some firms might go so far as to do you know full-scale mock-ups rapid know, prototyping think, yeah like you know look at Look at the space that like Kieran Timberlake has in their office in Philadelphia, where you know it's, it's not all necessarily you know done kind of through digital fabrication, but the idea is that they're thinking at scale mm -hmm. with the materials they intend to use, and then kind of you know using that to build an understanding of how to better design um, you know for whatever they're trying to solve with their clients. So that was a conversation I remember. You know, Shane and I were having that conversation quite a bit at Woods Baga, which was we were putting like a you know modest model shop into the into the new new york studio and talking about you know do we do we get a small arm you know there are ways to leverage that for multi-axis milling um and hot wire iterate you know there are ways that that would absolutely be something that would be practical and useful in the context of, of design iteration and we also you know had some conversations with you know some other facilities right like could we lease time with you know, somebody who has larger robots and has more expertise and just kind of get time on a robot when we needed it, incidentally. And we did a test of that. Actually, it was really, we found a place in the in the Navy Yards uh, to machine. It wasn't for one-to-one -one prototypes, but it was to do some complex tower models mm. where they had really ambitious, you know, forms that were really hard, like, we actually like found a few things where it was the most cost effective way to make a six foot tower model was to robotically machine it, which was delightful to me. I was like, Oh, this is actually like, we're not just doing this because it's fun and cool to do. Like this is actually the, you know, the best way to, to do this model. So we did actually like go to the Navy yard and like get a few models, but with a robot. So like there's, there's certainly an appetite for it. Um, but I think it tends to stop at that prototype level because it's just out of scope. Yep. So then it's really about it's really about building and it's not literally I am going to use a robot. It's understanding downstream industrial construction methods such that I can design better for that. Right. Like how do I if I'm a designer today and I'm operating in your typical like ecosystem of like Rhino, Revit, Grasshopper, Dynamo, is it any different to use those tools for like a modular or prefabricated construction than it is for kind of like a stick built or, or traditionally constructed building? Probably yes, but I don't always hear things discussed in that exact 
contact? Do I just have different Revit families that are preloaded, right? Like how does that, and like, what is the change on the computational design yep. approach? Do I start to think of things as kits of, this is, you know, something that like in teaching design computation is like, yeah, you can have a slider that goes from 0. 0.000 to infinity mm -hmm. and you can have as many significant decimals as you want. But often you want there to be discrete stages like, you know, this slider for my, uh, I don't know, facade panel size can only be two or four or six meters. Um, and that I think is something that there isn't enough focus on in design computation is like tuning the model's design space to modular increments such that it facilitates downstream industrialized methods. Um, because there's kind of a school of thought, which is like, well, digital fabrication allows me full freedom of form, but we know that that's not true. Mm -hmm. There are always, there's always some kind of constraint or friction on how that thing manifests itself as a physical material or artifact in the real world. And I think that if you can drop the obsession with form aside and just think about economy of manufacturing, then a lot of it's going to come back to like some pretty simple notion, notions around modularity. But guess what? Working with just rectangles and modules in Grasshopper is actually just as challenging as it is to work with with like radical freeform design. You know, Andrew and myself and many others at WeWork spent a lot of time automating rectangles and plan layouts and modules for walls, and it's re it's still really challenging mm -hmm. just in terms of like the implementation of the code and the logic and it's really intellectually fulfilling too because you know that this is going to have a huge impact you know that this is going to manifest itself as real functional space um and and you're kind of also moving from the obsession with form and kind of facade articulation kind of moves you from the outside of the building right kind of the artifice of the building to the you know the actual interior modules and, and spaces of the building that the end users inhabit and i think as designers we're often like several layers of abstraction away from that end user because of you know speculative real estate and, and various other um, delivery practices mm -hmm. so touching on that and sort of wrapping back to where we sort of started with the architectural student side what kind of people do you look for at Boston Dynamics? Are you is is it common to find someone with an architectural background, or more traditional programming, computer science? Yeah, you know it's funny because you know I'm the project manager uh, for the Boston Dynamics construction market, um, but also for the integrated Trimble solution, and then my counterpart David Burchick, um, he's you know he's ex architect, mm. right? Uh, he has that education you know, at his level, we're working together. And then, um, you know, he has some colleagues that also went to design school. So like when you get in companies like this, you actually realize they're more multidisciplinary disciplinary than, than you think. Um, especially when it comes to kind of all the teams that surround the core engineering team. Like if you want to be an engineer at Boston Dynamics, you still have to be a, you know, we still want a very talented robotics engineer, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's the core of our mission and, and what we do. But there are other opportunities too. Like we're right now, I don't know, you know, I assume this video is coming out, you know, fairly soon after this um, and that these job positions will be open as we're looking for field applications engineers. These are engineers at the applications level. You know, how do I connect the spot SDK to, um, you know, other types of software in the construction environment? and you know visiting customers and they might have a new type of camera or you know thermal imager or some kind of sensor to connect a spot and you're figuring that out and you know i would really love to hire somebody who has a ton of skill with .net and desktop stuff mm -hmm. and but who also has kind of domain experience and understands the value of why we would connect data from a robot to construction and design software, whether it's, you know, there's all sorts of stuff, right? There's your kind of like pro cores and your Autodesk ecosystem, the stuff we're doing with Trimble, reality capture as a space, um, all sorts of document management, construction management platform. You know, it's a fairly mature market out there. Um, and uh, there's a lot of work to do in making those connections and facilitating those with partner developers 
and customers. So that's an excellent opportunity for somebody who has, if you have Python chops, because our SDK client is in Python, mm -hmm. and you have .NET chops to write like C Sharp desktop applications in a lot of these things, and you have domain expertise and an interest in robotics, like you don't have to be a roboticist. Like that's that's a way to to get in the door and kind of build that career path. So, you know, these opportunities do exist um, for those who are looking for them and who have the, but you kind of have to have this varied background, right? And you get that varied background from working several jobs and kind of following your interest over, you know, years and years. And that's why back to the original question, like, how do I get a job in robotics? It's like, well, again, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult to plan for that because mm. like the person I'm looking for right now would probably have worked either a construction VDC job or maybe an architectural BIM design job would have maybe been involved with reality capture at some stage, would have would have done some coding at some stage. That's You're talking probably two or three different jobs to build the kind of varied background required to fit the bill. Yep. So do you think um, programming is becoming more important at the architectural student level? Oh, man. Yeah. So that's the age old question, right? Yeah. Because I, I don't, I'm not somebody who's like dogmatic about like, all architects must know how to code. And I'm I love no code. Mm -hmm. Like I love I love grasshopper. I love things like if this, then that I, you know, I love platforms that let me set up automations between my like, you know, Gmail and Asana without using code. Um, so for me, design computation is a kind of, you know, it's a critical lens, right? It's a way of thinking about the world. It's a way of thinking about processes and workflows that tends to break problems down in a very kind of discrete, logical way. You understand data flows like inputs and outputs. That kind of core understanding of how to break a, a problem down into a kind of data flow is actually really great, right? Because on one level, you could be doing, you know, a grasshopper definition. On another level, you could be doing like uh, a lean workflow where you're doing like current current state versus future state mm -hmm. mapping of, you know, again, how do I deliver, uh, you know, how do I go from raw materials to, you know, structural beams on site or something like that? Or in the case of the WeWork example, like how do I go from a design model to the manufacturer of storefront? to lay out and placing that on site and identifying gaps and being able to focus and solve those gaps. So I just think it's, you know, it's the same way people talk about architecture education where they're like, oh, it's a design thinking, right? And I think, I think computational design thinking is a thing. It's a skill that is the same thing as using those tools, but is also distinct because it's a way of breaking down really complex problems and understanding where you can find the most value and kind of focus on solutions, right? Little Kaizen bursts at these kind of gaps um, to kind of make things more efficient. So I would say that design computation as a methodology is a really important aspect of contemporary design education. And that is distinct from saying that everybody needs to learn how to code. It's, it's an interesting topic because uh, back when I was teaching Grasshopper in Tasmania, it was the first question, you know, first or second years would take computational design, that why I came here to study architecture, not programming. Why are you teaching me this? And I think it's the responsibility of an architecture school, not necessarily to teach everything, but to introduce as much as yeah. possible because yeah. everybody has their own methods and their own niche to find. Yeah, and you know, also, like, I didn't take a single design computation class in school, and I'm fine. Like, that's the, <laughs> the other thing about this is, like, yeah. you know, a lot of it just boils down to the curiosity of the student. And, you know, so much of being a good teacher is the ability to see each student as an individual and understand what motivates them and just feed that, yep. right? Um, so, uh yeah, it's it's a really complicated question, but it's mm. a, it's a lovely debate to have for another time, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, that's another, <laughs> that's another episode. Well, um, look, Brian, uh, I think I've taken up enough of your time. I would like to say thank you very much. I'm sure my audience will appreciate your time and uh, your insight into robotics and your work at Boston Dynamics. Yeah, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. Thank you again, and have a lovely afternoon. You too.